We are honored to be speaking with Dr. Harold Varmus, director of the NCI and a Nobel laureate. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. We heard age-adjusted death rates are falling, which is fantastic news. What do you attribute this to? Well, uh, as I tried to emphasize in the talk, every cancer is different. So in every, for every cancer type, uh, the, the, the explanation for falling death rates is, uh, is, is going to be different. And of course, I also would point out that not all cancers are seeing a, uh, a decline in age-adjusted death rates. So for some, there has been an increase. Um, in some cases, it's pretty clear like lung cancer. We know that when we diagnose lung cancer, it, uh, the, the outcome is not likely to be terrific, and we really haven't progressed on the treatment front, but we've progressed dramatically on the behavioral front in getting smoking rates down. And the reason we're now seeing a decline in death rates for women with lung cancer is because the incidence has gone down. You can learn a lot by looking at the incidence numbers as well as the death rates. Given the dire budget situation facing the NIH and NCI, you have had to prepare for as much as a 5% cut to the Institute. What are some of your strategies for coping in the current challenging funding environment? And also, how can scientists make a difference? Well, um, you know, we don't actually know what we're going to do if there's a 5% reduction. We're hoping that won't happen. Uh, if it does, we're going to have to make some very deep decisions about what part of the portfolio we want to support at the something approaching the usual levels. One difficulty in thinking about the NIH budget is that uh, most of our money is committed. That is, it's already pledged to, to programs, to grantees who are in the second or third or fourth year of their grants, mm -hmm. and we don't want to pull back in any major way on that commitment. Uh, so the amount of flexible money we have each year is only about a fifth of our total budget. And uh, the real challenge here is when that when that flexible money has been reduced <clears throat> very measurably by a 5% overall cut, then we have to do some things to the commitments. And that's where I'm reluctant to say anything yet. Uh, for, even for a flat budget to keep up the usual pace of doing new things, uh, we have to tuck in our belts in some, in some uh, important ways. And I've already said that we will um, probably make some reductions across the board, small haircut size cuts, um, but, uh, and to um, a number of things, including current grantees to the intramural program, to uh, cancer centers. Uh, we're also looking at some large programs by doing careful reviews to see if we can reduce some of those large programs that um, have traditionally been among the NCI strengths, uh, but uh, under these circumstances, require a level of scrutiny they haven't been subjected to before. How is the bypass budget going to be different from the past in a way that may resonate with Congress, especially with the current budgetary challenges we're facing? Let me first of all amend the question a little bit because uh, the bypass budget itself is, of course, a budget and it's got a, a request for a 15% increase, which is totally un unrealistic under the current circumstances we'd be very happy to have a 5% increase. So the budget itself is not likely to be enacted. But the budget, um, the budget narrative, the, the justification for that budget request, um, is changed, not in dramatic ways. You know, it's a dramatic change from what was done 15 years ago. But over the last uh, dozen years or so, since uh, Rick Klausner was NCI director, it's been a slim, attractive volume, and it is this time as well. Uh, we have changed things a little bit, and then we've tried to place more emphasis on the longer narrative, that is, on showing that uh, approaching any single cancer involves a story, a story involving a lot of people, a lot of methodologies, uh, a, a long history, uh, a long-term a long support. And uh, we have done something that is a little unusual. We've singled out six cancers uh, by a rather arbitrary process. Uh, nobody who works in another cancer should feel insulted, but we took uh, six cancers in which there's been significant advancement this last year, and we've tried to show what that advance means, uh, how it came about, tracing the long history and the need for sustained commitment to cancer research to make these things happen, even though you see something happen this year. It didn't just happen this year. It's based on many years of, uh, of uh, steady growth and what we know and how, how to apply that knowledge. 
how do you balance all of the exciting different areas of cancer research that you outlined today in, the, in this funding environment? And you talked about behavioral research, provocative questions, clinical trials. Well, the NCI does have a $5 billion budget, and we support people who do many different kinds of things. Uh, and I think one of, one of the things I like a lot about our grants program is that every year we have a chance to fund new applications that represent some of the most exciting science across the board. So the balance is achieved to a certain extent um, by, first of all, the, the history of commitments to certain disciplines, because as I mentioned earlier, we have a large commitment base and that's going to be honored. But the, the, change in, the gradual change in allocation is going to be influenced by what's proposed for grant support in that year. And uh, we get together as managers of the NCI program each, each uh, well, almost every week actually, uh, to talk about um, which of the grants that received high scores we're going to fund. And that has a major effect on the program. The other aspect is to say, um, as a group, um, that we are not adequately addressing certain areas of research and let's set aside some money or develop some kind of new program. And that's what I'm trying to do in uh, a few areas, such as uh, global health. Um, and there, um, anticipating your next question, um, we do already have a fair commitment to global health through a, uh, a scattered series of programs that have not ever been coordinated with some fairly specific long-range goals. And what I'm hoping to do in creating a center for global health, just give you one example of how things are formulated, is to identify a distinguished leader in the global health arena to come in and uh, attempt to bring the many things that we are doing, whether it's collaborative research uh, with a foreign country or whether it's uh, uh, research addressed to a region-specific problem like esophageal cancer in China or whether it's making use of genomic information to interpret cancers uh, that happen to occur at a high rate in East Africa uh, and um, uh, or uh, some smaller initiatives we have underway in Latin America and in Russia. Uh, try to bring together all those components and then say, what do we need, what, what can we do as a country that is advanced comparatively in its efforts to understand and control cancer to help reduce the dramatically increasing rates of, of cancer and cancer mortality uh, in poor countries. Um, poor countries have always had a lot of attention given to infectious disease. But, oh, I say always, I mean over the last 20 or 30 years of intense interest in global health. And as we have frankly succeeded in lengthening life expectancy in those countries, the frequency of, uh, of cancer has gone up as you might expect, it's largely, not entirely, but largely an age-related disease. And it's time to say that even though certain kinds of treatments are not appropriate to very poor environments like pancreatectomies or radiation therapy, there are a lot of things that can be done by behavioral modification, including smoking cessation, by other kinds of preventive strategies. Think vaccines for, against HBV and HPV remembering that uh, roughly a third, almost a third of cancers in poor countries are caused by infectious agents, and we have means to control those infections or prevent them. Um, and then by thinking about uh, uh, ways to control symptoms with fairly modestly priced, very modestly priced pain painkillers and uh, antiemetics, uh, we can make life more tolerable for people who have cancer. We can do simple surgeries. Uh, to prevent the kind of uh, fungating enormous lesions that are commonly seen in poor countries. So there's a lot that can be done. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. You've got to think this problem through country by country. You've got to work on the management of, of health delivery systems that vary dramatically among countries. But there is much more to be do, much, much more to do than has been thought about in the past. And we're trying to consolidate efforts, not all that expensively, to, uh, to focus on this issue. Dr. Varmus, thank you so much. It's an incredible honor. Thank you.